Father, we thank you for the tremendous privilege of gathering on each Lord's Day to hear from you through your word. And I do pray that people would have come with anticipation for that, that this would be a time that you would speak to them. And if they didn't have that anticipation previously, I pray that you would grant it to them, uh, that they would have it now, Lord, as they look forward to what you want to say to them. I do pray that that's what this time would be, in a sense, asking that you would remove me and that you would meet with your people. It is called your word because it's what you want to say to us. And I thank you for this life that we can look at and just how magnificently it reveals your mercy and grace and forgiveness. I don't know <clears throat> if Manasseh is a, fil- a familiar man to, to many of us, but I do pray this morning that whatever from this man's life, you've ha- you would have us learn the wonderful truths that we can see, not so much about him, but about you and your dealing with people, that uh, we, could, we could glean that. I do think this is a very powerful uh, account. I pray I, really that you would allow me to do justice to it and that you would just use me as your vessel to minister to your people. And I pray that if there's anyone here who isn't yet forgiven by you, who is uh, like Manasseh prior to his conversion, that today would be the day of salvation for them. You would grant them repentance and uh, grant them faith in Christ. We thank you that your son has died for our sins, and for the believers here, continue that sanctifying work into his image. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. Hopefully you have a handout with you that has the lessons that we'll be uh, filling in. The title of this morning's sermon is Fruit Worthy of Repentance. Fruit Worthy of Repentance. We're going to be looking at one of the evilest men who ever lived. You did hear me say that correctly. I don't think that there's any Jew or Gentile in Scripture that approached the wickedness that this man engaged in, as we'll see as we go through these verses. Go ahead and turn to Second Chronicles 33, please. Second Chronicles 33. This man's life was disturbing, uh, somewhat grotesque even. So there are some powerful things we can learn from him, though. 2 Chronicles 33. says, Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. This is the longest reign of any king in the Old Testament. To give it some perspective, or give you some perspective, David, Solomon, and Saul all reigned for only 40 years, but Manasseh for 55, verse 2, but he did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had cast out. This would be the Canaanites. So he engaged in the similar wickedness to the Canaanites whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. For he, this is Manasseh, He rebuilt the high places which Hezekiah, his father, had broken down. He raised up altars for the Baals, and he made wooden images for them. And he worshiped, notice this says, all the host of heaven and served them. So looking at this, this individual seemed to worship every false god he could worship, every god imaginable except who? of Yahweh or except Jehovah, except the true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He worshiped everything and anything else that he could. For a moment, we're just going to briefly pause our reading about Manasseh so I can share something with you that will give you a better context for what we just read. Manasseh's father, does anyone know who he is by chance? He was Hezekiah. Um, unbelievably, one of the greatest kings and reformers in the entire Old Testament was the father of this evil man. Let me share a few verses with you. 2 Kings 18, verses 4 through 6, says, Hezekiah removed the high places and broke the sacred pillars. He cut down the wooden image and broke in pieces the bronze serpent. There was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor who were before him. Now, if you're looking up here at the verses, you might notice that God could have easily said that Hezekiah removed the sin from the land. And so it begs the question, why does he go into such detail, and and why does he use the repetition of of so many verbs, like removed, broke, cut down? Why doesn't it just say that Hezekiah removed the sin? It's, It's God is going to lengths to describe the ruthlessness or severity with which this man attacked the sin in the nation as though it was a cancer. Did you notice that? The the words were in in cap, they were capitalized, removed, broke down, cut down. 
It, it pictures the ruthlessness or severity. It serves as a type for us of the way in which we should attack sin in our lives. The way that Hezekiah attacks sin in his nation looks to the way that we should attack sin in our lives, that we should cut it down, we should remove it, we should, we should break it. Think of the parallel um, verses from Christ in the Sermon on the Mount when he says that what are we supposed to do with sin? Not break it, cut it, or remove it, but to you know, pluck it out or to, or to cut it off if our, sin, if our eye or our hand was to cause us to sin. As you read about many of the kings in the Old Testament, it'll say that a king was good, but then it'll say that there was one thing that remained. Does anyone know what that is? And it's almost sad. It's almost unfortunate. You're you're anticipating it describing this king very wonderfully, and it describes him very well, and then it says, but what remained often? The high places. The high places. I mention that because Hezekiah was one of the few reformers great enough, along with Josiah, to remove the high places from the land. Hezekiah has that unique distinction, and it was a tremendous accomplishment, con- tre- tremendous accomplishment, accomplishment excuse me, considering the number of other good kings who had failed to remove them. Now, I mention this because if you look at verse 3 in 2 Chronicles 33, it says, Manasseh rebuilt the high places, which Hezekiah, his father, had broken down. Can you consider the tragedy of that? That his father had gone to such great lengths to remove the sin and idolatry from the land. He had removed the high places that had previously stood for some number of decades, and then his son comes on the scene and rebuilds them. So Manasseh really became king and then reversed all of the great things that his father had done for the Lord. And here's what else makes Manasseh so terrible. He re- it would be one thing if he was the son of Ahab, right? <laughs> because, or Ammon, and then you could look and you could say, okay, well, we can understand why he's so bad, but do you see why Manasseh's sin was particularly worse? He rejected one of the greatest heritages that any king or any person in the Old Testament had, being the son of the great king Hezekiah, which makes his actions even worse. I think there's application for children and for parents in this. The application for children is, you're a, actually, let me just say it like this. If you're listening to me right now, if you can look up here and see me, and you're a child, your accountability is considerably high. Do you know why? Because your family brings you to church to hear the word of God. And you're very fortunate to be sitting in one of these chairs and have parents that bring you to church to hear God's word and know him at a young age. It makes you more accountable, though because there's a responsibility that you're going to respond to God's word because there are lots of other children right now, and guess where they are? They're sitting at home. Their parents don't give a thought to coming and worshiping on the Lord's day like this. They don't give any thought to being involved in the body of Christ and serving. And so I would just tell you, if you are a child, you should look to your parents at some point, hopefully today, and you should thank them for loving you. Thank them for bringing you to church where you can worship the Lord. Thank you. Thank them for bringing you to a church that preaches God's word, that is not liberal, that does not follow the world. Um, You probably do not recognize at this time in your life the great blessing it is for you to be receiving what you are right now. But let me just tell you, as someone who didn't receive that as a child, it is a tremendous gift that your parents are giving you, and you need to be very thankful for them. Now, the application for parents is I think Manasseh can be probably the greatest encouragement in all of Scripture to the parents who have a rebellious child or a prodigal child. Because when I look at this account, what I see is you could even be Hezekiah and have what? (laughs) Manasseh. And so I've, my oldest is 11. And so it's hard for me to tell at this point what, how many of my children have embraced their faith and made it their own, or whether they're doing what they believe pleases us versus doing what pleases Christ. And, but at this point, I have seen enough godly parents, good parents, who are better parents than myself, have a child that has rebelled and turned from the Lord. And if there's one place in all of Scripture that I could point them to, to encourage them, probably along with Jehoash, that young son that was raised in the temple by, by the godly priest and the godly mother that he had, and then he turned from the Lord along with Jehoash, Manasseh is that other individual that can provide great encouragement to to parents. So if you have served the Lord faithfully and you have raised your children to know the Lord and then you've had one that has turned from the Lord, I just hope that you can be encouraged by this example and see that even if you're Hezekiah, 
there can still be a Manasseh that can, that can come from even, even the best parenting. Take a look at verse 4. He also built altars in the house of the Lord. I mean, notice this. Notice where he put these altars. See, the problem is we can read through this stuff so quickly, we lose sight of the significance of it. But where did he put these altars to other gods? He put them in the temple. He put them in God's house, of which the Lord had said, In Jerusalem shall my name be forever. And he built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. Notice he also put these altars in God's temple as well. Verse 6, and this must be the wickedest thing that he did. He caused his sons, and notice it's sons plural. Notice it's not one son. He caused his sons plural to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. He practiced soothsaying. He used witchcraft and sorcery. He consulted mediums and spiritists. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. It seems like he filled the temples or filled the temple with as many idols as he could humanly fit in there. According to God's law, everything Manasseh did was punishable by death. But I believe the worst sin of his in, in this whole account has to be the sacrifice of some number of his sons to the false god Moloch. I really can't imagine anything wickeder than that. The parallel account in 2 Kings 21.16 says of Manasseh that he shed very much innocent blood until he had filled Jerusalem with it from one end to another. That's how much human sacrifice he had led the nation to perform. The end of verse 6 says Manasseh's actions provoked God to anger, and his sins included soothsaying, medium, spiritists. The modern-day equivalents of these would be astrology or horoscopes or fortune tellers. Now, considering that those actions provoked God to anger when Manasseh performed them, you can look and you can see what we as Christians have no business being involved in. Christians have, have no business being involved with any astrology or horoscopes or fortune tellers or any of the occult or anything along those lines. And the reason I, I emphasize that a little bit is because I don't have to say Christians have, uh, should not be involved in adultery. I don't have to say Christians shouldn't be involved in idolatry or theft because we know that. But Christians can lose sight of the reality that these sins provoke God to anger, and Christians just don't have, Christians who want to serve the Lord and live holy lives have no business being involved with astro the modern-day equivalents of astrology, horoscopes, or fortune tellers. Look at verse 7. He even set a carved image, the idol which he himself had made in the house of God of which God had said to David and to Solomon his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. A few things make this particularly bad. How many idols do you think were in the nation at this time? <laughs> uh, an uncountable number, right? But apparently that wasn't enough for Manasseh, and he needed one more. There had to be one that at least he himself had built. He couldn't take one of the ones that already existed. So he created his own, and he went and put it in the temple. And the parallel account in 2 Kings 21.7 says the idol was of Asherah, who was the Canaanite goddess of fertility, and so she was worshipped through ritual prostitution. And so, God, so Manasseh also took God's temple, and he turned it into this place of, of ritual activity that was terribly immoral and, and sensual. Take a look at verse 8. And I will not again remove the foot of Israel from the land. Or in other words, let me back up just to give a little momentum to that verse. Look, in, look halfway through verse 7. Um, what God said in this house and in Jerusalem, which I've chosen out of the tribes of Israel, I'll put my name forever. Verse 8, and I will not again remove the foot of Israel from the land, which I have appointed for your fathers, only if they're careful, the Israelites are careful to do all that I've commanded them according to the whole law and the statutes and the ordinances of the hand of Moses. So Manasseh seduced Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, notice this, to do even more evil than the nations, which would be the Canaanites, whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. So I wouldn't believe it if it wasn't written here, but it actually says that Manasseh led Judah, or led the Jews to be worse than the Canaanites, that God had Israel drive out. And so that what that means for the Jews to be worse than the Canaanites 
is Manasseh was introducing sin and wickedness into the nation that hadn't even been seen before. He, it's almost as though he was pursuing outlandish and, and grotesque sin and perversion that he could find for his people. When you think of the evilest people in the, in the Old Testament, I think second only probably to the Amalekites, the Canaanites are who come to mind. And you're told right here that the evilest people, the Jews, became worse than them. Look at verse 10. The Lord spoke to Manasseh and to his people, but they would not listen. Now this verse is a tremendous example of God's graciousness because I think of the way that the Jews were acting up to this point and what would you not expect God to do? Come on, what would you not expect God to do considering how wicked they've been? Speak to them, reach out to them, draw, draw them back as we were singing about, draw them to himself, call out to them, appeal to them through the prophets to, to see them brought to repentance. It's easy to look at this verse and not see ourselves in it. I can talk about God calling out to these wicked people, the Jews, and we could say, well, you know, I wouldn't do that. But I, I do think there are ways that this verse can apply to us because I would ask, do we read God's word and disregard what he's saying to us through it? If we read God's word and we disregard what he's saying to us through it, then we're being like the nation of Judah, at least at this time, in the sense that God spoke to them and they would not listen. We don't hear audibly from God through prophets today. That is, a, that is a, an office that has ceased. We have, the, we have the fullness of God's word at our fingertips. And so when God speaks to us through the word and we don't listen, we're very much engaging in at least that similar sin, not all the other sins of the Jews, but at least that sin of not listening to the Lord. And so do we hear God through the scriptures and then ignore, choose to ignore what he's saying to us? If we're doing that, we're doing what the Jews did. James 1.22, we must be doers of the word and not hearers only. Look at verse 11. Therefore the Lord brought upon them the people of Judah, the captains of the army of the king of Syria, who took Manasseh with hooks, bound him with bronze fetters, or these are just like shackles or chains like you might picture inmates or prisoners wearing, and then carried them off to Bab Babylon. Now, since Judah would not repent when God appealed to them, if you were at the Sunday school hour, you know that God is loving, but he's also holy. He's also just. And because these people would not listen when he had graciously appealed to them, he is bound to punish them. He's bound to discipline them. And so that's what we see taking place here. I mean, and this looks to one of the reasons that God does warn us or he does rebuke us because he wants to see us repent so that he doesn't have to judge us or punish us, that he doesn't have to discipline us. But because the Jews didn't listen, that's what's happening here. And the hooks, if you notice in the verse where it talks about these hooks that are being referred to, these are hooks that went through the people's noses. And then the hooks would be attached to the central rope that ran this way, and all the people would be attached to that central rope by this hook that went through their nose. I mean, obviously, when there's a hook in your nose, you're not going to travel too far from the rope that's going to start tugging on it, right? And see, so so, well, did you really have to tell us that, Pastor Scott? I know that's what you're saying right now. <laughs> I, I did. I mean, it's in the verse. I want you to understand what we're reading. But even more so, I just want you to know this is what God had to do. This is what God had to do to his people who wouldn't listen. How much better would it have been for them if they had repented versus getting hooks in their noses and then being carted out of the land and drawn off to, to Babylon? Now, what I want you to consider is who else was taken? Who else was taken? Manasseh was taken, and he is really suffering right now. He is really suffering. This man has lost everything. He was king. He was wealthy. He was powerful. He was able to enjoy this very luxurious and extravagant lifestyle, and now he's got chains on his feet. He's got this hook in his nose, and he's being carted off to Babylon, probably in line with most of the other Jews that were going. And this brings us to lesson one. Lesson one. In affliction, you can harden or humble yourself. In affliction, you can harden or humble yourself. It's a great picture to go with this, this gentleman crying out to God. Do you know Beige chooses all these photos? Does everyone already know that? She probably doesn't want me to single her out right now, but that's too bad. <laughs> she chooses all these great photos that go on the slides, and every time I look down there, I'm always pleased with the ones that I see. So, yeah, this man, this is what we can do. You can humble yourself and cry out to God, like in this picture, or you can harden yourself. 
Those are the choices that we face when we're suffering because we can get angry with God that we're being disciplined, that he's letting this happen to us, uh, which would be the response God doesn't want. That's the response he's not trying to produce. The response he's trying to produce is humility that produces repentance. Now, before we look at Manasseh's response, I want to show you another king. Briefly turn to 2 Chronicles 14, just a few chapters to the left. Before we look at Manasseh's response, I want us to see another king. 2 Chronicles 14, verse 2 it says, Asa, King Asa, he was one of the good kings. He did what was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. I just want you to be able to see these words for yourself with your own eyes. Asa was a good king, and he did what was right. He was one of the best kings in the Old Testament. But at the end of his life, something happened. Now turn two chapters to the right to 2 Chronicles 16. Two chapters to the right to 2 Chronicles 16. Here's the context. King Asa faced an enemy army, but instead of turning to God for help, like he'd actually done a few chapters earlier in chapter 14, he turned to the ungodly Syrians for help. And God was angry with him that Asa would seek out the help of the Syrians versus seeking out his help. So God sends this prophet to rebuke him. Look at verse 7. So we're in 2 Chronicles 16, verse 7. Hanani said to Asa, this is the prophet that's rebuking him, because you have relied on the king of Syria and you have not relied on the Lord your God for help against the, the enemy that attacked, therefore the army of the king of Syria has escaped your hand, or king of Syria has escaped your hand. So he's rebuked in verse 10, and now let's see if he hardens himself or whether he humbles himself. Look in verse 10. Asa was angry with the seer. Seer is another name for prophet and put him in prison. So he imprisoned the prophet that rebuked him. He was so enraged at him because of this. It says, Asa even oppressed some of his own people at that time. Have you ever seen someone get angry about circumstances or difficulty in their life and they just turn to attack anyone that's around them? Or maybe if we're honest, there have been times in our lives where we're in a bad mood and perhaps we take it out or somewhat attack those people who are around us. When you're king, Asa had the power to attack or, or punish, or not punish because they hadn't done anything wrong, but attack the people around him in such a way that he could throw them into prison and he could terribly oppress them. So I hope this is a simple question. Did Asa humble himself or harden himself? He hardened himself when this prophet rebuked him. It gets even worse. Look at verse 12. Here's where we see him being in affliction. In the 39th year of his reign, Asa became diseased in his feet. That was his affliction. His malady was severe, yet in his disease, he did not seek the Lord, but the physicians. Now, there's nothing wrong with going to physicians, but the verse is written in such a way so as to show that he had hardened himself and he would not turn to God for help. And I'll tell you, I don't know how you look at verse 12. This is a gracious verse. This is an example of God's graciousness right here in verse 12, because this is the man who's coming to the end, very end of his life. He's not finishing well. And by God afflicting him with this disease in his feet, God is giving him another opportunity to do what? And it was merciful of God to do this. To do what? Repent. Turn to him, which he hadn't done when that he turned to the Syrians and was when he was attacked and turned to the Syrians instead, which he didn't do in his repentance when the prophet Han and I rebuked him, and unfortunately, which he didn't do when he got this disease in his feet. But you need to understand, this was gracious of God to reach out to draw this man to himself one more time, but Asa hardened himself. Now, there are many people in Scripture who responded poorly when they suffered. I chose this example because it takes place with a man that you saw in 2 Chronicles 14, 12, was described as what? Good, or 2 Chronicles 14, 2, described as good. He was a man who did what was right. And the reason that's more challenging or sobering to me is if I was to see an evil man who responded poorly when he was afflicted, I would think, okay, no big deal. He's an evil man. I expect him to respond poorly. But we're looking at a good king that responded poorly when he was afflic afflicted. And what does that tell us? The fact that this could happen to Asa means we need to be aware of the potential for this to happen to us. If Asa could be afflicted 
and harden himself, then we could be afflicted and we could harden ourselves versus humble ourselves to God. And I'll tell you something that I wouldn't believe if it wasn't written in Scripture. Just as much as Asa was one of the best kings and Manasseh was one of the worst, believe it or not, Manasseh, of all people, is about to put Asa to shame. Go ahead and turn back to 2 Chronicles 33 to watch this evil king put good King Asa to shame. 2 Chronicles 33, verse 12. Remember, Manasseh was carted off to Babylon. It says that he's in affliction. And let's just see if he hardens himself or humbles himself. 2 Chronicles 13, 12, a beautiful verse. Encourages me every time I read it. When he was in affliction, he implored the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. A great example of how we should respond when we're afflicted because of our sins. Many wonderful examples of repentance in Scripture. Our minds can go to David after Nathan confronted him. Our minds can go to the people of Nineveh when they repented under Jonah's preaching. Our minds can go to the prodigal son when he returned to his father. Our minds can go to the thief on the cross when he, he confessed his sinfulness and confessed Jesus as Lord. But I don't think any of those examples even are as dramatic as this example we're looking at right here with Manasseh because I don't think there's anyone whose wickedness approached Manasseh's wickedness. I don't know that you can show me another example of repentance in all of Scripture that compares with this example we're seeing right here, because I just don't know anyone else in Scripture who did the things that Manasseh did. I don't know anyone else in Scripture who lived as wickedly, pursued evil as, as intensely as this man did. And for him to turn to it, I mean, the the example of repentance here is just the magnitude of it is, is hard to find anything comparable. Look at verse 13 to see how the Lord responds. Verse 13, Manasseh prayed to God, and he received, God received Manasseh's entreaty. God heard his supplication, and God brought him back to Jerusalem into his kingdom, and then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. That is salvific language. What I mean is that's the language of saved people. That's Old Testament language for people who know the Lord. To say, when it says that Manasseh knew that the Lord was God, he is a saved man. We are going to see Manasseh in heaven someday. Can you believe that? Now, that is definitely not a credit to Manasseh. That is a credit to who? God and his what? And there should be a whole bunch of things you can blurt out to me. It's a credit to God's what? His mercy, his grace his love, his compassion, his forgiveness. I mean, I don't know that you see another better example of it in all of Scripture. Now, some people, they would take issue with this. They hear me say that Manasseh will be in heaven and that we'll see him there, and they say, well, how could you say something like that? How could you say that a man this evil could ever be in heaven someday? Because of the God we know, because of the God we serve because the sacrifice of his son would be such that even a man like Manasseh could be forgiven. At, w, at Willing Christian Church, we've been going through Luke's gospel. We recently reached Luke 11, which records Jesus' teaching on the Lord's Prayer. I've been stressing to my congregation that Jesus encouraged us to pray to our Heavenly Father. And I also said that thinking of the relationship between uh, an earthly father and his children can influence the way that we view our heavenly father. It's a very sobering to me as a father to consider that my children are going to view their heavenly father through the way that they view me. Or the way that I treat my children is influencing my children regarding the view that they're going to have of their heavenly father. For example, if you had a, cr a cruel earthly father, then you might tend to think that your heavenly father is the same. If your earthly father was unforgiving, then when you, if your earthly father was unforgiving, then when you think of repenting and turning toward God, then you might expect your heavenly father to say something like this. You did all these terrible things, and now you're going to have to pay for them before you ever think of me hearing your prayers again. You're going to have to work off all these sins. You're going to have to spend some amount of time in misery I mean, if your earthly father was like that, you're going to expect your heavenly father to be like that. You only need to read Luke 15 about the prodigal son to see when that son returns. Did that father say, okay, but you're in the barn. You're with the animals for weeks, months. You're eating their food. 
You will not come back into this house considering what you've done, considering the way that you've acted, the way that you've lived frivolously, your prodigal lifestyle. It's good that you've repented and come home, but now it's time to make amends for what you've done. If your earthly father was like that, that's what you expect your heavenly father to be like. But go ahead and read Luke 15 about the father, and the, pro- the father to the prodigal son to see how God wants us to understand what he's like. Now, that's just not the God of the Bible to make us um, pay penance. Now, penance is somewhat dear to me in, an, in, a, in a way that I despise because I was raised Catholic. So for every sin, guess what I was expected to perform? Penance. It just came with it. For all of my sin, there was some amount of penance to, to pay off that sin. That is not the, God, the way the God of the Bible does things. The New Testament account has the parable of the prodigal son, and I would say the Old Testament account that parallels the prodigal son, you're looking at it. I mean, is there a, is there a, a better example of a prodigal son than Manasseh? And he comes home, and, his, and God the Father receives him despite all the terrible things that he had done when he humbled himself, when he repented. God brought him back to Jerusalem. Now, here's what you could say. You could say, how do we know that Manasseh was really repentant? How do we know that? Because it's so easy to sound repentant, but it's another thing entirely to actually be repentant. Now, if you said that, if you had that objection or question, you were completely right. And so how do we know that Manasseh was repentant? And this brings us to lesson two, genuine repentance bears fruit. Genuine repentance bears fruit. If I had to think of just name just one man in the New Testament, second to Christ, who could preach repentance and see people repent, who, who comes to mind? I mean, it didn't matter who's coming out to be baptized. This guy is just screaming the same thing at them. Matthew 3, 8, Luke 3, 8. John the Baptist said, bear fruits worthy of repentance. You could be a heathen. You could be a tax collector. You could be a prostitute. You could be a religious leader. And when you're coming out to see John, John is saying, bear fruits worthy of repentance. That's the message that he had for everyone. Now, these words tell us something about repentance that I think we don't often consider. I would actually go so far as to say that John's words, bear fruit worthy of repentance, reveal why so many people fail regarding their repentance. Our repentance must produce fruit. When I say the word repent, what is probably the first word that comes to mind? What's almost synonymous with repent? Stop, right? I say repent and we think of stopping. And that's good, but that's only half of what it means to repent. The other half of repentance after you stop is starting something. It's not enough just to stop. You've got to start something. In Scripture, this is known as, you don't think this is my, my opinion or that I'm inferring this, it's known as putting off and putting on or severing and replacing. The clearest passage discussing this is Ephesians 4. Will you mark your spot in 2 Chronicles 33? We'll turn back to it and go ahead and turn to Ephesians 4. If you perform some Christian counseling, which I said at the marriage conference this weekend, all of us should see ourselves as Christian counselors. This is a prime chapter for you to have familiarity with because of the um, instruction it gives us regarding counseling people and helping them repent and understand repentance. So I just encourage you to remember this, take this passage with you. This is the clearest teaching, I think, on putting off and putting on. Let's say someone struggles with lying. If you're talking to that person, you might think that what you should say is, okay, we'll stop lying. If that's all you say, you're only giving them half of the instruction, half of what's needed for them to repent of lying. If they're going to repent of lying, they've got to stop lying. That's what they have to stop, but they've also got to start something. They have to sever lying, but they have to replace it with something else. Look in verse 25. Therefore, putting away lying, here's what you repent of, here's what you stop, here's what you sever, here's what you put off. But then it says, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. Do you see the fruit? That's the fruit that must be produced. That's what you must start. That's what you must put on. That's what you must replace lying with. So if you have a problem with lying, it's not enough to simply simply stop lying. You have to make a conscious effort to start telling the truth, which probably means being deliberate regarding the accuracy of the things that you say. 
Next, let's say you struggle with stealing. Look at verse 28. Let him who stole still no longer. That's what you repent, you want to repent of. This is what you stop or put off. And then it says, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give to him who has needs. So do you see what you stop? And then this is what you start. You put something off, you put something else on. This is the fruit that's produced. If you have a problem with the way that you talk, look at verse 29. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. Repent of this, stop this, put this off. And then it says, but what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers? That's the fruit to produce. This is what you have to start. This is what you have to put on. It's not enough to simply stop saying unwholesome things. You have to consciously start saying edifying words. So if you're a mother, for example, and with your, you're with your children a lot of the day, and you're frustrated with the ugly things that you say when you lose your patience, and you say, I am not going to say ugly things to my children anymore. I am repenting of it. But you stop there, you're going to fail. Because what's the next thing that you have to say after that? What am I going to start saying to them instead? I won't say these ugly, cruel things anymore. What are those encouraging, loving things that I will say instead? Do you think you're going to walk around like this all day? <laughs> it's not enough to stop without starting, without putting on. Skip to verse 31 where Paul sums it up. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Repent of all that. Stop all of it. Put it off. Verse 32, put all this on. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. That's what you're going to start. You're going to replace all the sins of verse 31 with the fruit that's listed in verse 32. You don't have to turn there, but Paul communicates the same truth in Colossians 3, I think I said to you before, God repeats himself when he wants to make sure we don't miss something. And the other account teaching this, if, because I guess God says, well, if you're going to miss it in Ephesians, hopefully you'll catch it in Colossians. Colossians 3, you're to put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language, out of your mouth, stop all that. And then Paul lists everything to produce. Put in verse 12, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long suffering, bearing with one another, forgiving one another. If you genuinely repented of the sins in verse 8, then you are going to put on or produce the fruit that's listed in verse 12. You probably notice that the verses are listed in opposing pairs or opposites. In other words, when you repent of something, you try to produce the opposite of that as fruit. And the reason that I mention that is because maybe you've been listening and you're looking for your specific sin in Ephesians 4, your struggle. And you say, oh, this is terrible. I don't see my struggle right there. If you understand that the fruit you're supposed to produce is the opposite of the sin that you were committing, then you simply need to ask yourself, what is the opposite of this sin? What is the opposite? Then that is the fruit that I need to produce. We're looking at one of the main reasons that people say, I stopped doing this, I repented, why do I keep struggling? What I say to people is, when they say that to me, I say, okay, well, you stopped this, but what did you start? Well, you put that off, but what did you put on? You repented of that, but what's the fruit that you started producing? That John the Baptist said, hey, if you're going to repent, you need to bear fruits worthy of that repentance. To be practical, you stopped going to bars. You've been convicted about it. Where did you start going instead? What did you start doing instead? Maybe this is when, just to put a plug in for the home fellowships here that are starting. <laughs> And if you used to go to the bars two or three nights per week, then you get to find two or three home fellowships, I suppose. You stopped yelling at your kids. What did you start saying to them instead? You stopped watching things you shouldn't. Did you start reading your Bible with that extra time you had? You tried to stop coveting. You want to stop coveting. Well, what did you start giving? How did you start being generous? What's the fruit that you produce? In the language of Ephesians 4 and Colossians 3, you put off bitterness, wrath, anger, but did you put on kindness, tenderness, forgiveness. So let me give you an encouragement. Our prayers regarding repentance, they really need to be twofold. First, Father, what do you want me to change? What do you want me to stop? I am convicted of this. What should I repent of? But then the second part, you must say, what do you want me to put on in place of that? What do you want me to start doing? What do you want me to produce instead? What fruit do you want to see accompanying my repentance? 
Now, with that in mind, go ahead and turn back to 2 Chronicles 33. And if you kind of think of like a toolbox you bring along with you as a Christian, those resources, you're familiar with God's word and places to turn, places to use in counseling people, Ephesians 4 and Colossians 3 can be invaluable regarding helping people repent, taking them there when they say, I need to stop this, and then helping them see that there's something that they have to start. So here's the question. Since anyone can say sorry, since anyone can act like they want to repent, was Manasseh really repentant, and how are we going to know? I'm glad you guys asked that. We're going to know because his repentance is going to produce fruit. If he put off all of that idolatry, if he stopped all of that sinfulness, then we better see some fruit here, right, to legitimize this repentance. Look at verse 14. After this, he built a wall outside the city of David on the west side of Gihon, in the valley as far as the entrance of the fish gate, and it enclosed Ophel, and he raised it a very great height. Then he put military captains in all the fortified cities of Judah, and here's where it gets particularly good. Listen to all this. Listen to all this fruit. He took away the foreign gods and the idol from the house of the Lord and all the altars that he had built in the mount of the house of the Lord and in Jerusalem. He cast them out of the city, and then he puts this on, verse 16. He repaired the altar of the Lord. He sacrificed peace offerings and thank offerings on it, and he commanded Judah to serve the Lord God of Israel. So we talk about stopping and starting. We talk about putting off and putting on, severing and replacing, repenting and producing fruit. And Manasseh is a tremendous example of that. I mean, along with Zacchaeus, he's probably one of the best examples in all of Scripture, although he's often overlooked. I don't think it's too much to say that it seems, based on these verses, that as much effort as Manasseh was previously putting toward wickedness, he now starts putting toward godliness toward serving the Lord is a wonderful encouragement to read. So here's what we need to ask ourselves when we sin. Does our repentance bear fruit? When we're sorry, does it lead to change? Now, if you really want to know the answer to that, I would ask you, if you're married, you can ask your spouse. If you're convicted about the way you've talked to your children or treated them, you can ask your children. Sit them down and say, I've been convicted about the way I've been talking to you. Have you noticed a change with me? If you're, if you're a child, then you can ask your parents, Go ahead and look at verse 17. Nevertheless, the people still sacrificed on the high places, but only to the Lord their God. So that's kind of unfortunate, is that we're reading this, going through this, it's looking really good, we reach verse 17, and then we see nevertheless or however, which is like a word of disappointment or discouragement to us. Clearly tells us everything's not perfect. This brings us to lesson three. It's going to have three parts. Lesson three, forgiveness doesn't mean no consequences. Part one, we might not be able to undo what we did. Repentance doesn't mean no consequences. Part one, we might not be able to undo what we did. So back in verse 13, it says that God heard Manasseh's prayer and then God restored him as king. And then you look at that and you're like, wow, this is unbelievably gracious of God. I cannot believe it. And then you say this, oh, there must be no consequences. He got to be king again. No vestiges of, of consequence, consequences from his sin. There were definitely consequences for Manasseh. Looking back at verse 17, ironically, the high places are mentioned again. Yes, the high places are being used for God, but you can tell that is not a good thing. Yes, it's good that they're being used for God versus being used for Baal or Moloch, but it's not a good thing that the high places are being used because people should have been worshiping at the temple. So another way to look at it is they're worshiping God, but they're not worshiping God the way that he commanded or the way that he prescribed, which was at least at that time at the temple. So the point is, no matter how sincerely Manasseh repented, no matter how hard he might have worked to remove the idolatry from the land that he had introduced, could he get rid of all of it? No, there were still these vestiges left. And it must have been a constant reminder to him every time he looked at those high places, a reminder that his father had removed them. He rebuilt them, and now the people are continuing to use them. And it's important to keep this in mind because sometimes people, unfortunately, 
equate forgiveness with the absence of consequences. Let me say that one more time. Sometimes we think that just because we're forgiven, there's not going to be consequences. Churches are filled, filled with forgiven people who are still suffering the consequences of some of their sins. Have you ever heard that saying that it's easier to ask for, ask for forgiveness than for permission? And what that means is, well, I know I'm not going to get permission, so I'll just do whatever I want that's bad, and then I'll just ask for forgiveness after. That is such an ignorant statement because it's showing that these people do not expect to have consequences after they're forgiven. And the truth is, when we sin, we can be forgiven through Christ's sacrifice, but we should still understand there will be some number of consequences for those actions. The next part of lesson three, forgiveness doesn't mean no consequences part two for others. There are consequences for others. God is repetitive when he wants to make sure that we don't miss something, and twice we're told that Manasseh led Judah to act worse than the Canaanites whom God drove out of the land. You can see it in verse 2. I'll make it quick, but in verse 2, he did evil in the sight of the Lord according to the abominations of the nation whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. Verse 9, so Manasseh seduced Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to do more evil than the nations whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. Now, here's why I'm telling you that, and here's why God might have told it to you twice previously. When you know that God removed the Canaanites from the land for their wickedness, and then you read that the Jews are behaving even more wickedly than the Canaanites, what do you expect? If the Canaanites were going to be removed from the land because of their sin, and the Jews are being wickeder than the Canaanites, what do you expect with the Jews? They're going to be removed from the land. If God removed the Canaanites, he's definitely going to end up removing the Jews, which is exactly what happened within 50 years. And then you say this. You say, well, Manasseh repented. Manasseh repented, so why was Judah punished? That's the lesson. The lesson is there's consequences for sin for others, even if we're repentant, even if we're forgiven. There were terrible consequences for the nation after Manasseh repented. In fact, maybe you don't know this, but if there is one man in all of Judah, of all the millions of Jews, who is singled out for Judah's exile in Babylon, it is Manasseh. He is the man singled out by name and held responsible for the Jews' exile in Babylon. 2 Kings 24.3, Surely at the commandment of the Lord, the Babylonians came to remove Judah from God's sight because of the sins of Manasseh according to all that he had done. Jeremiah 15.4, God said, I will hand Judah over to Babylon because of Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, king of Judah, for what he did in Jerusalem. And there were lots of other evil kings in Judah. I mean, Zedekiah and some of his cousins and brothers and his father, I mean, the, the kings at the end of Judah's <clears throat> kingdom before they're brought in textile, he was a, these were terrible kings. None of them were singled out by name, but Manasseh was. And what's the point? The entire nation of Judah paid for Manasseh's sins. Sin affects more than just the sinner. That idea that the, that the pebble is thrown into the pond and there's all those ripples that go out. It's like with Achan. People think Achan's account is so unfair because so many people suffered because of Achan's sin. Not just his family, but the people that died in the battle of Ai. You know, Christians can be up in arms sometimes about the unfairness of Achan and his family being killed. Achan is one of the best examples in all of Scripture that sin never affects just the sinner, that there are always consequences for others. And that's so important for us to remember because there's such a selfishness associated with sinning because we're sinning, understanding that we're going to hurt others in the process. That, that's why this is so important to keep in mind because when you're thinking of sinning and you say, okay, well, I can handle the consequences. Well, maybe you can, but what about how your family's affected? What about how your children are affected? What about how your parents are affected? What about how your siblings are affected or your spouse or your friends or your coworkers or your neighbors or your church family? Always affects more than just the sinner. And Manasseh is a great example of that. The last part of lesson three, forgiveness doesn't mean no consequences. Part three, our kids might carry on our sins. Our kids might carry on our sins. Manasseh's son was a man named Ammon. Look at verse 21. 
Ammon was 22 years old when he became king. He reigned two years in Jerusalem, but he did evil in the sight of the Lord as his father Manasseh had done. For Ammon sacrificed to all the carved images which his father Manasseh had made and served them. And Ammon did not humble himself before the Lord as his father Manasseh had humbled himself, but Ammon trespassed more and more. So Ammon became king after his father. Everything that he learned from his father, the wickedness, was already so entrenched in him that his father's repentance had little effect on him. So yes, Manasseh wanted to turn things around later, but the simplest way to say it is it was too late. It was too late. He had raised his son under such an umbrella of wickedness and evil that even when Manasseh turned his life around, all of his sin had been passed to his son. And he had to sit there and watch his son engage in that same sin. Notice twice, this is interesting, notice twice Ammon's wickedness is attributed to his father Manasseh. It says, Ammon did evil in the sight of the Lord as his father Manasseh had done for Ammon sacrificed all the carved images which his father Manasseh had made. Who was, who was the biggest casualty of Manasseh's wickedness? It wasn't Judah. It was his son. His son was the biggest casualty. He became king after him. He never, he never recovered from what his father did. And so here's what's really interesting. If Manasseh would have been alive to watch his son Ammon reign, he would have felt just like his father Hezekiah would have felt if Hezekiah had been alive to watch his son Manasseh reign. I mean, sometimes there is tremendous justice in God's word, tremendous justice that we see God mete out to his people. And this is one of those examples. Manasseh had to watch his son carry on those sins I mean, if he could see him from heaven, just like Hezekiah would have had to watch and see those sins be carried on too. And so I would just say to the fathers, one reason not to sin is obviously our relationships with the Lord. What is one of the other tremendous reasons as fathers for us not to sin, but to lead holy lives so that we don't see those sins passed on to our children, so we don't have to see our sons living out or daughters living out those sins that we committed. One of the great ironies of Manasseh's life is Manasseh reversed everything his father Hezekiah did, and then who reversed everything that Manasseh did? His son. A lot of great reasons not to sin, and one of the greatest is so those sins are not passed on to our children. Although this chapter can seem um, tragic in some parts and, and very challenging in others, I want to invite you to see this chapter as one of the most encouraging in all of Scripture. And this brings us to lesson four. Lesson four, Manasseh shows God's mercy knows no bounds. Manasseh shows God's mercy knows no bounds. Some people have addictions to anger or anxiety, or pornography, or uh, drugs, or drunkenness, or alcohol. Manasseh is a man who literally looked addicted to evil. He looks like he woke up every single day looking for how, or considering how he could live the most offensive way to God as possible. You would be hard-pressed to find anyone who pursued wickedness as intensely as he did. He seemed to hate God more than anyone else in Scripture. He's almost a satanic figure through those early verses in this chapter. It wasn't just enough for Manasseh to sin. He just had to sin in the worst way possible. He couldn't be like other men and sacrifice one son. He had to sacrifice multiple sons. He couldn't just be like Solomon and worship lots of other gods. He had to go and put all the idols for them in, in the temple. Manasseh lived as, each day as though his greatest desire was to carry out this personal vendetta or this personal hatred against Yahweh or against Jehovah. It was an evil, disturbing life. But this is what I would say to you. As unbelievable as Manasseh's actions were in most of this chapter, there is someone else's actions who are even more unbelievable. We might marvel at what Manasseh did 
and the wickedness of his life, but we must marvel even more at the actions of someone else in this chapter, and who's that? That's God. As unbelievable as Manasseh's actions were, I am even more amazed. I find God's actions even more unbelievable and astonishing than Manasseh's actions. Because I look at God's graciousness in this chapter, I look at his compassion and mercy, and I think it's tremendous. It is unbelievable. I wouldn't believe it if it wasn't written here. And it's beautiful because if only people who committed a certain amount of sins, if only people who had not reached a certain level of wickedness could be forgiven. In other words, if you went past that line and were too wicked, did too many evil things that you couldn't be forgiven, wouldn't that say something unbelievably sad about the cross? Let me say that one more time. If there was a limit to how much wickedness could be forgiven, think of the unbelievably sad statement that would make about Christ's sacrifice. So when you look at Manasseh, what do you get to see? There's like no threshold. (laughs) There's no line that's drawn in the sand that you can't go past and still be forgiven. I want to get you to think about something. There's no wasted words in Scripture. I mean, the Bible's pretty big, and whenever God takes up any of that precious space with some of those words, there are reasons for that. And so I I think I was just having a conversation in the Greens house this past weekend, and I said, we were talking, I think it was with Bree, and it was like, why doesn't God tell us more about the creation of the stars? It's like, he created the stars. I'm like, that's it, God? That's all you got for us? I mean, give me some more details here on the creation of the stars. I especially think that when I read a chapter like this, because I'm like, God, you want to give us all these details about this evil, disturbing man and all the horrible things he did, and I only get a few words about the creation of the stars? Why don't you shorten up the passage about Manasseh and give us more about the stars, right? There's a reason for it. There's a reason for it. There's a reason that God did it this way. There's a reason God did it this way versus just saying Manasseh was really, 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 really evil. You get all these verses because it shows you what God is willing to forgive. It's all these verses that reveal his compassion and his mercy. It's all that detail, all of the grotesque details that you cringe just reading that God graciously puts there so you can see how much he's willing to forgive. I want to give you an illustration. My wife, Katie, who's in the back with our daughter, Ruby, she's never really been into expensive jewelry which is one of the main reasons I married her. No, just joking. <laughs> I was joking. Did someone boo? Okay, okay, forgive me, forgive me. Okay, okay. Um, since she has not been into expensive jewelry, I have never, she has never asked me to take her into an expensive jewelry store and look at you know, fancy diamonds and so forth and rings and, and stuff that's way overpriced. But even though I've never been in any really expensive jewelry stores, I know what they do. They take out these diamonds, and where do they put them? Where do they lay them? They don't lay them over wood like this. They don't lay them over the, the, some white paper or plastic. They lay them over what? The blackest, darkest velvet background. And why do they do that? It brings out the beauty of the diamonds. It helps you see the beauty of those diamonds even better. Do you see how God did that in this account? Do you see how he revealed the beauty of his mercy and forgiveness and his compassion? That velvet background is what? It's Manasseh's life. It's a life like Manasseh that's required to reveal the greatness of God's compassion and mercy and grace and forgiveness. Because if God forgave Noah (laughs) or Daniel or Samuel or even David... Because then you can say, yeah, he committed adultery and murder, but he was still so great in so many other ways. What good can you see from Manasseh prior to his conversion? Point to the one place where it says anything good about that man. And so if God forgave a man like I just mentioned those other men, you would say, well, you know, big deal. That's not very meaningful. But you can really appreciate the greatness when it's against a backdrop like the life of a Manasseh. 
we have to recognize there is nobody, nobody beyond God's forgiveness. I would even submit to you, if you sit here today and you say, God can't forgive me, you are a proud, proud person. You are a very, very proud person. You actually think that you could do something that's greater than the cross. You actually think that you could do more than what Christ could do on the cross. It's one of the proudest things that a person could say. As encouraging as this account is, it also carries a very heavy burden. If you heard this today, I'm just going to tell you, you have a very, very heavy burden on your shoulders now, and this is why. This account removes the potential for you to make a certain excuse. You can never say, since you have heard this account, God can't forgive me. You can never say that now that you've heard this this morning. Now that you're familiar with Manasseh's life, unless you've been worse than him, and if you have, don't raise your hand because you'd need to be arrested (laughs) and removed out of here as quick as possible. So I know you haven't approached that wickedness. Here's what you cannot say. I have done too much for God to forgive me. I have done too much for God to be merciful to me. You cannot say God could never love me. You cannot say that. This chapter destroys that excuse. You need to humble yourself. You need to repent. You need to look to Christ for forgiveness and then be received by the Father the way that he receives his son. And what did Manasseh do to be forgiven? Let's think about that. He repented, and then there was... That's all he did to be forgiven was he repented. But then there was fruit to legitimize his repentance. So if you sit here and you say, I repented, I repented, I repented, you know what I would say? Let's see. Let's see. Let's just watch your life. People come into the church sometimes. I don't know how how long I've been preaching. If I'm running out of time, I'll just pretend like I'm not. (laughs) People come into church sometimes, and they're so excited, and they're on fire, and they can't wait, and they're like, do you only meet next Sunday, or we meet again tomorrow, you know, and give me a Bible. I'm going to read every chapter. And I hope that enthusiasm, I hope that repentance over their sins is sincere. But there's only one thing that's going to reveal whether it is or not, and that is time. Let's see how you look in a few weeks. Let's see where you are in a few months. And there's always some people, they come in and they're so excited, they're so thrilled, you don't even see them next month. Say nothing about next year. So to me, it's not what someone says at that moment or how broken or sorry, or maybe you just thought this was a great passage to read and you're very enthusiastic today about repenting and following the Lord. It's not about just this moment. It's about where you are next month, next year, next decade, and finishing well. Now, if you have any questions, if there's, if there's any ways that I can pray for you, I'll be at my um, book table in the coffee room. I'll be here with my wife until the last person wants to talk to us. It's always a privilege to be here. I'm, I'm thankful for you guys. It's a wonderful congregation, very similar to ours. I, I enjoy the opportunity. I know Pastor Kerry covets his, his pulpit and doesn't share it um, lightly. So thank you, brother, for the privilege of being here. Um, you owe me three sermons at my church now. <laughs> Just kidding. No, not really, though. Okay, all right. (laughs) Let's pray. Father, what a tremendous gift this account is. I mean, what a blessing it is to see what you forgive. I thank you for Manasseh's life, definitely not because of the wickedness that he performed. It's, It's offensive, and I know if it offends me, it's even more offensive to you. So I don't thank you for that evil, but I thank you for that velvet background. I thank you for what you reveal through this man's life, And I thank you that you put all of these details in Scripture. They're painful to read, but just how wonderfully they reveal the grace and the mercy that you're willing to give to that humble, repentant sinner. I pray that all of us would recognize that. None of us are beyond a Manasseh. None of us are beyond your forgiveness and the gospel's work in our lives. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for giving your son to take the punishment for our sins. We thank you that he hung on that cross in our place. And if there's anyone who has not embraced that sacrifice, we pray that they would and that it would be genuine repentance that produces fruit. And we pray these things in your son's name. Amen. 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 Let's go ahead and stand for our last song.